Um, but I'm interested because what's happened, I think, for me, and is it now I'm starting to see my work in the sort of social practice arena? Mm -hmm. But that there was actually an intermediate stage where I think a lot of people, there's enough of us that live in this in this other place. Mm -hmm. And I think it, if you look at the Venn diagram, there's this other thing that I don't know what to call it, but I call it, I, used, I was calling it lived performance for a while. Okay. Um, or maybe life practice, where your life and your process are the same thing. Mm -hmm. And I've lived there for a really intense parts of my life. And then I think there's an overlap with people that are working strictly in a social practice, mm -hmm. where that, where you're both, where you're doing that, this thing, where you're in the middle. And then I think there are people that are just in the social practice and sort of just in the lived performance or life work as well. So let's talk about those distinctions as you're yeah. them. Like, describe, for instance, you, how you envision, see or observe social practice, and then describe what you're calling life performance. And then I from those two, where you see yourself in relation. Yeah, this is the struggle. I've, I've had many, many extended conversations. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess for me, the other thing is like, so before, let's like maybe start with the project before Guided Blind Date that slowly turned into Guided Blind Date. Let's do it. Um, or maybe even before that. I don't know how much of my work, there's some on my website. I don't know mm -hmm. if you look. I have to so there's I Want to Put You On, which is the Zippa body suits, yes. um, which is, um, they're all people I desire or covet part of their lives. Mm -hmm. And so then I. Know them? They're all people I know. Okay. Um, so they're all people I desire to have a part of their lives. So I go to their homes and I sit down with them and I say, say like, let's talk about what it means to offer yourself as an object in my work, to, for me to take a portrait of you, to do all these things. And we had set up a portrait once we sort of worked together. I'd set up strobes, camera on a tripod, everything, and we worked to get a portrait of them. Once we got that portrait, we would switch positions. I would put them behind the camera. I would get in front of the camera and I would say, tell me how to be you. Mm -hmm. And they would instruct me on how to perform. I hesitate to say totally and simply their identity, mm -hmm. but it's whatever they wanted to be perceived as, as their identity, or it was that negotiation of themselves and their own understanding of right. themselves in that moment. In that moment and how they wanted me to perform that thing. Yes. And so I would, I would make some attempt at performing for them their identity that they were instructing me on how to be them. Mm -hmm. Then afterwards we would sit down with a bottle of champagne, look through the pictures of me, and when they said, that's me, that's where you got me, I would take two images and put them together there. Right. So they're choosing the perform the moment of performance that they identify as themselves. Mm -hmm. So I struggled with how to label that, but I always think of it as the intersubjective portrait moment. Oh, like where that. our two subjectivities sort of clash in the middle and make this third thing that is neither them nor me, mm -hmm. nor something that either of us truly maybe understand in its simple form, but it sort of creates this otherness. Talk a little bit more about how you come to that through photography. So this, how you come to this notion of wanting to experiment or explore um, these ideas of otherness, but using photography as a means by which to do that. I think it's just my um, before. I I grew up with my mother as a, a photo hobbyist, and she would she won like magazine contests for her beautiful black and white. We had a you know, a um, enlarger in the basement that at some point I convinced her to set up a dark room and like she taught me how to use her 35 millimeter camera as soon as I could pick one up. But I was an actor. I was born and I was always, when I was, you know, I was like Humpty Dumpty in the kindergarten. And, um, and in high school, I did something like 36 plays in, with my high school theater company. I went to undergrad for music theater. Um, my BFA is in music theater. I went on a couple of, I went on two national tours. I, by technicality, have on and off Broadway credits. Like, my whole life was theater. I'm trained as an actor. I have no 
in terms of like visual theory that you get, if I had gone to an undergrad for photography, my notion of an art practice, I think would be wholly different. Um, I don't, like I read these sort of seminal texts on photography, like Susan Sontag's on photography and all this stuff, and it's alien to me. Like that notion of photography to me is over and dead. I mean, that's why we can celebrate the death of photography is because we don't actually, like, stop. I will never give my students that text without saying this is a historical text. Mm -hmm. This is not how you should think about image making and what an image means to in a contemporary society. Like wow. that's, there's still this like deified idea of the, um, of the of A, the photograph as an object, and B, the decisive moment. Mm -hmm. Both of those are still cornerstones of our understanding of photography in most photo departments, right? Both of them fail us greatly if we think of photography in that way. Mm -hmm. Photography is so much greater than that. So let's talk about the contemporary moment of photography and where, where we are now thinking about photographic practice. To me, photographic practice runs everywhere from, you know, this, like the Bertinskys who are still going out there and like shooting, like finding that. I think of two practices. Mm -hmm. when, I, when I talk to my students about photography, I do really still see the hunter and the seeker. Mm -hmm. I mean the hunter and the builder, excuse mm -hmm. me, right? I go out there that the act of pressing the button is almost where it ends, right? Like that's the, the moment of completion because I've been hunting, I've shot it, literally like the language also sort of aligns itself with that. Mm -hmm. um, and then I like go and like resolve it maybe is like the way of thinking of it. And those are the types of people that if you say, oh, do you use Photoshop? They say, oh, but just curves. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, like, calm down. It was like, I'm not attacking you, right? That like, that that's real. That, 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 and in a sense that the idea that an actual piece of film is more real, it's, it's both plastic. Why is your plastic more real than my plastic? It's plastic, metal, chemicals, all of it is the same. You're, you've just decided that because light presses in and burns in that yours is more real. Well, that's exactly what, how a digital sensor works. It just counts photons. Mm -hmm. It's no different. In fact, it's actually closer to the way that your eye understands light from because of the bare mosaic pattern on the back of your eye it, or in the digital sensor is the same as the back of your eye, right? So it's like this sense that now that I'm using a digital camera, it's not as real. Now that I can manipulate photography, it doesn't show us the real. Like photography has always lied to us. There's never been truth in photography, yes. even if it has just been by inclusion or exclusion in a frame, mm -hmm. simply going back to that, I'm still a manipulator. Mm -hmm. I'm still lying if you're looking for the truth. Mm -hmm. I mean, the idea that photography, like we've trained America to believe that photographs are real because then we can manipulate people with them. And if we keep training our photographers that they're showing the world the real, mm -hmm. we're doing everyone a giant disservice. Well, I think you touch on exactly where, at least in terms of educating students in, in photography and the development of the language and the acquisition of the body of knowledge around photography, where we always come back to, you know, this kind of, um, so ultimately at the end of the day, when they approach graduation, it's up to them to kind of decide in which realm they see themselves working. Well, and we tell them they have to pick. You see? I, I mean, not you and I, right? right? Like, I tell them, don't pick. But it's almost a limitation of academia. It's of course that, I mean, especially the art school academia, right? Like, this yes. whole idea that, like, 
you know, I, I think my, my friend Kate always refers it to as the silo model, mm -hmm. right? Like, we're all silos in a field. Like, painting goes over here, and then sculpture goes over here, and then photography finally got its silo. We'll put photo in there now, too. And, like, performance is over here. And, like, what happens when we're not a bunch of silos in a field? What happens when we're, like, throwing a party in the field? That's right. Right? Like... I'm into the party. Mm -hmm. Like, I like where it all gets fucked up. And the media needs the right? party. Right? That's right. The media needs it. And I think in some ways, so like trying to steer that, that, those ideas back into this sort of like lived performance or social practice or what is that thing, right? Um, I think there's something I think w what you're writing about, like generosity, is really interesting to me because I think that sometimes I get read as actually really self-serving when I'm giving everything away. Yes. Do um, you want to talk about that? Yeah. I think, so I think one of the, the, the moment, the, 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 the thing that sort of happened with me, and I love that you talk about like, like, it's not like you want to strip away, like, good and bad and from that conversation as, like, whether it, quote, serves the public in a good way or in a, or in a, or a negative effect on this sort of, like, moral high ground meter. Um, so I did this project that's not anywhere right now. I mean, I can give you a, a link to um, a locked blog about it. Um, so I, um, I don't know why. I, I've tried to explain that moment that it was, but I woke up one day and just wrote someone and said, will you do this? Um, not thinking anyone would say yes, which is usually what happens and it gets me in trouble. Um, I, uh, I spent 365 days on uh, four sex now and dating websites. So my expression is manhunt to match. Um, looking for people that I wanted to go out on a date with. When I found that person, I would look at their profile, how they imaged themselves and what they said about themselves. And I'd pre-visualize a portrait of them, a photographic portrait of them in my head based on their online projected persona. And then I would write them, well, you go out on a date with me, but the date has to be my date. And all of them agreed to this ahead of time. I would show up at their homes, having never met them before, never spoken to them on the phone only conversations through the website and then ultimately text message to make that sort of the, the meeting location easier. I'd uh, walk in their front door, give them whatever they wanted to drink, which they had told me ahead of time, usually throw a glass of wine or a beer in their hand, go through their wardrobe, costume them, out, costume them out of their own wardrobe, and then restage their apartment. And within the first 30 minutes, photograph them as the person I thought they were gonna be based on their online profile. Um, and then I would go out on a date with them. Uh, that date was totally our time. I did not document that date in any way other than like up here. Um, I gave them cameras. Some of them photographed parts of it. Some of them took video footage that was up to them. I wanted to give them agency in that process and make them feel free to sort of like, if I, they felt they wanted to turn it around on me, they were more than welcome to. Um, Strangely, I did not ask anyone to do this, but during that period of time, um, the date, every single one of them looked at me and said, I can't believe you thought I was that guy. Let me tell you my whole life story. And they would mass confessional to me. And it was really interesting to have that moment where you're like, wow, I, all I did, I didn't tell them who I thought they were. I photographed them as who I thought they were. And that to them was so eye-opening that they felt the need to talk to me about like their mother, their father, all their exes, like, like what they believe their greatest weaknesses and strengths were, where they really feel they are in life. I mean like really very, very intense. What does that convey to you about the power of, of imaging? Well, they, they, they did know that I was going to take a second image at the end of that. Mm -hmm. And I think they wanted to show truth. So 
so after that date, I, we would return to their homes if we'd left. I mean, sometimes, honestly, it was like sex on the living room floor over re-photograph. Right. And like, with like a little like rolling around on the floor conversation where it was like this weird mass confessional. And sometimes it was like out to dinner, go to an opening, do all this stuff. That was like, like a more traditional idea of date, date, right? So they sort of ran the gamut in the dates, but they were, they were always filled with like really deep confessions. And not confe- like not a confession, but like a really intense conversation about right. what we expected from each other, yeah. who we thought each other was, where we sort of failed in that, and why I might think that they were like kind of a jock when really at the end of the day, it's just like a couple of things they said that became these sort of salient points in their profile. Mm-hmm. And they didn't even realize that they were highlighting that part of their persona to try to like pitch it at people to make them s- seem more attractive. And then they got more people. So there was this sort of like weird conversation about that. And so that sort of like led to much deeper conversations about identity and who we were and how we worked and what we wanted and why we were on said site and all of these other things. Mm-hmm. Um, and this, and a, and a lot about the, like the struggle of like how where we believed identity was located in a lot of ways like as Americans it, I mean what is it um, and rational realist what uh, what am I thinking of where like the the person becomes the center of the universe and it's I'm like sure. oh, I can't think of the it'll come to you. it'll come to me. Um, but there's this sort of idea that like we as people like slowly whittle ourselves down and like we find ourselves and then we like get to the core of us and then everyone can like sort of celebrate and look at us and see us as like oh, they're here you know like it's like that's such a problematic idea like I'm an ever changing fluid body in motion like I I don't like whittle myself down until out of this like block to discover who I am right. like I am an ever-changing ever discovering person about who I am you know um, there's a lot of conversation around that I think um, and also like about how you pitch yourselves to like make yourself seem more attractive yeah. what you sort of delete or what you sort of highlight the and that's the editing process because and there was a reason I didn't use Facebook and it was because other people are involved hmm. most people I mean li- literally the, the amount of people that said you know I finally decided to do it so I sat down drank a bottle of Pinot Grigio and wrote a profile. Like no one else is like fact checking this or like looking at it. You know, you might let your best friend look at it, but really it's all coming from you. This is the dating dating sites. Mm -hmm. And I was really interested in that Mm -hmm. pitch, not Mm -hmm. the one where everyone's like tagging photographs and including comments and no, 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 no. Um, I know, right? I told you she's a big slut. She's like, what lap can I get on now? Um, but so I became really interested in that. And um, so then after, after the date, we, I would re-photograph them. And I think that knowledge that there was going to be another photograph that would be altered and changed by this experience, I think ultimately that there was a large part of that mass confessional that felt like, I need you to understand who I am so that you can take that and make a true, honest photograph of me. Hmm. And so how do they differ then? People have a really strong response to Drew, though I think the photographs aesthetically are very similar. Hmm. Talk about it. Um, He's a constant favorite for other people, which is funny to me. I mean, I love Drew. He's Mm -hmm. adorable and great. And we had like a really fantastic date. and with some of these boys, I still have relationships with to a certain extent. Because mm-hmm. um, originally the project was supposed to end when I found someone that made me want to stop dating. Um, at 11 months, it, I, I had an intervention. <laughs> um, 
so like whereas these I think these two aesthetic are aesthetically are very different mm -hmm. you know as images um, so I think it really depends on each of these um, I mean some of them just they're in the same space mm -hmm. right like they're both in his bedroom so I think the aesthetics of it are really similar, similar. Um, I think I don't think aesthetics went into it at all for me like I think the, f I think the first photograph generally tends to be really flat mm -hmm. for me, mm -hmm. but I, I can't see anything in this work other than like my life for a year. In this, in this particular like, project? I, yeah. I, all I see is I spent 365 days making this. Mm -hmm. I went out on a hundred, over a hundred blind dates. Mm -hmm. I had relationships with all of these men. Mm -hmm. I had three pretty significant breakdowns. Mm -hmm. I bet. Like, I, it was the hardest and most rewarding year of my life. Mm -hmm. um, I learned so much about me and so, <laughs> so much about dating um, and all of these other things. But it's like, I can, these, none of these are simple photographs for me. They're not simple photographs. Yeah, like I look at them and I see like, I, there's, I have a large archive of all the, all the digital conversations back and forth between the two of us. Mm -hmm. um, and so, like, I mean, this, for example, like, he didn't tell me he had a boyfriend. His boyfriend came home in the middle. <laughs> so I convinced his boyfriend to get in the photograph. <laughs> right? Like, it's just, this is Patrick. He, like, I, I really liked him. Mm -hmm was like really excited to go out on a second date. Mm -hmm. The second guy I went out with ended up, hit the two of them ended up together. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I went on a date with him. And he was like, I have two more weeks of work. I really want to see you again. I just need to finish up these last two weeks and then we'll talk. And then he started talking to me less and less. And then the next thing I know, and I went out on a date with another guy, and I was like, oh, this, is, this was great, but it wasn't as good as the first guy, whatever. Like, I'm holding out for him. And then, like, my whole Facebook wall one day was Pete said to Patrick, Patrick said to Pete, Pete said to Patrick, Patrick said to Pete. My whole Facebook wall. And I was like, whoa, I guess they must be dating. <laughs> you know, and all of a sudden, like, the first two guys, like, so there was, like, lots of weird things. Um, in the middle of the project, I had somebody turn it around and do it to me. Oh, is, it, is that, this oh, is I me? See, I see. So I really wanted to know what it felt like to be on the other side. side of it. Yeah, I'm interested to hear you talk a bit more about how the camera functions as a mediator in your life and your relationships with other people, um, and the way that you conceive of the subject. You know, you kind of start with this. Um, there's this process, there's a particular methodology that I hear you describing. And this methodology lends itself to a few of your projects. I mean, yeah, you're, you're I, speaking I- Speaking in a continuum. I mean, I think one thing I like is I like to play with strangers, mm -hmm. or I like to play with other people. Mm -hmm. I like, I always think that like, um, I'm not quite a control freak. I think a control freak says like, we're working in this box. I'm like, no, no, no. We're working in this box. You can't see the walls because they're so far away. Right. But these are the rules right. to this game. You know, come play with me. Yes. Let's find out what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And I'm really interested in the, you know, I, my friend and art historian David Getzi always says, you create the most contentious relationships through, like through your work. Mm -hmm. Because I'm always like, come on! You know, and... Where, what is that, con I'm, I'm curious to know what that contention is. You know, like what is... Where, where do you locate, if there is a struggle, yeah. where do you locate that struggle? And does photography in some way become the uh, device by which you get beyond that? Or does it continue to perpetuate? Well, I think it? it's the, I think it's the sort of instigator. Instigator of it. I think that I'm 
I think it's I'm trying I, I think that there's something about right like that intersubjective portrait moment where I'm like what happens when we try to make a portrait of me performing who you think you are right. like what happens mm -hmm. well, what, what is that mm -hmm. right because it's not it's not really either one of us that's mm -hmm. in that photograph anymore mm -hmm. right like and, and it's most successful when it, when like the zipper just sort of feels like it happens to be there mm -hmm. and isn't separating the two of us. Right. In some of those, in the ones that are most successful, I think that that's what, that's what happens, is where like the zipper is only a cue that what you're seeing is not one person. It is right. not a simple thing. Right. What we're looking at is a much more complex thing than that. Right. Um, Right, like that's where it's most successful in that work. Mm -hmm. Like in this work, it's like, I think the thing that is most interesting is the thing that's sitting in the middle of the photograph that isn't even there. In the work that you just showed. Yeah. Right, like I'm giving you like the, the cover and the back cover mm -hmm. and, 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 and telling you that there's an awesome book in the middle that you can't read. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, like. Like something has happened. Like, and I'm, and I'm, I'm like, right. And, and, and that's the part that is like almost the selfish part of me. It's like, no, I get to keep that. Mm -hmm. Oh, we can talk about it. Like, I'll tell you anything you want to know. You just got to ask the questions, mm -hmm. but it's, it's that, that thing. And at the same time, like what I really learned in making that, in making that work was, and the, and the struggle that it, the place that it left me was a really ultimately a dark one or it sort of left me floating mm -hmm. out to sea um, because I slowly realized over time that like I was starting to shelve the inconvenient parts of my persona, like my personality. Like I was like, okay, you're inconvenient. You go over there, you go over there, packing you up, packing you up, packing you up, packing you up. And I actually like totally like shifted. I had a little moment of like what I would maybe even not really anorexia, but I did stop kind of eating in there. Mm -hmm. I dyed my hair blonde. I tried to, I started photographing myself and mimicking other photographs online of people that seem to be either considered very attractive online or very, or like they were on the more popular side of like, so I was starting to like try to perform other people that were sort of finding more success in the sort of like online dating realm yes. and putting those photographs back into the system and seeing if I became more successful in that way. Mm -hmm. So I started actually physically and sort of like psychologically altering myself. Um, and somewhere in there, I, I went from being a person that was like very confident and happy with me to someone that only understood the world based on exterior approval. And you think that that is because of you allowing yourself that kind of exposure, that kind of over oh, yeah. saturation of exposure to... Well, to putting myself into a system in which the only time you win is when you get someone else to like want you. Right. To like to like you. I, put, I didn't even realize that I started a game in which I could only win if someone decided I was the best thing they'd ever met. Mm -hmm. That wasn't my intention, but that's what putting myself in that game and what that, it's not necessarily what the system, I, I think maybe it is to some degree, what the system is sort of designed to read as, is like online dating websites are successful when a lot of people find mates or sex or whatever it is on there, right? That's the system I put myself in. Mm -hmm. So then, and I wasn't even really thinking about like winning in that way, mm -hmm. but it so becomes the only language, like it became my only understanding of the world. I was, I had a friend who was like, I love you. We've been friends since the fourth grade. Let me know when you're done. I'd love to see you then. And was like, <laughs> was like, I can't, I can't right now. You need to like, I'll see you in a couple months. That literally like told like told me he didn't want to see me until the project was over. So something something happens. Something happened to you. Yeah. You know, it changes something in you. And 
would you say that you opened yourself up to a particular kind of community? Oh yeah. In that regard? Oh yeah. I I mean I think I also became this like weird like sage mm -hmm. for people that were like on, like struggling with online dating. Mm -hmm. Like they would come to me and be like, "Can you look at my profile?" And I would like help them. Like I have this whole I was I was talking about doing an online website, my pro, my profile makeover because like everyone would come to me and be like, "You know. You understand." Like and if I brought it, if I ever brought it up, it would always, everyone would be like, oh my God, I totally, I have, and, and it would just be like this sort of like intense conversation starter on that sort of community and that world and like, oh, I did that for a little while, but, mm -hmm. oh, I'm thinking about that, what website should I use? Mm -hmm. And I sort of became the person that everyone would like turn to with questions about that sort of world mm -hmm. um, and I think also I was like to some people I was a model for like what not to let happen to you <laughs> overdosing on. yeah the, the sort of like overdose on that like and and it becomes like this weird like addictive fix on like I need approval I need approval I need approval but you're also creating a, a intervention into that space you're yeah. disturbing it oh yeah I was definitely disturbing way. it and and so you're subjecting yourself to it but then you also create this distance because you're able to objectify it in a way that it's not necessarily objectified right by bringing in well camera. using myself as an object yes. too as like and I think that that's what ultimately happened is I started crafting me mm -hmm. to like suit the spaces mm -hmm. Um, and so I mean, we jokingly refer to him as the tap dancer, the guy that like I became by the end of it, because I would walk into per people's homes, put all of me that was inconvenient away and be the most charming, wonderful version of me, give them everything I could give them so that anything I asked of them was very simple, right? That, so that they could trust me so that they could feel comfortable when I said, will you put that on, will you stand over there, will you take your pants off? Right. You know, like some of them are naked. Right. I asked them to take off all their clothes in 20 minutes. You know, one guy I was like, well, I was kind of hoping you might take off your clothes. Um, you know, and he was sort of like, well, I mean, it's not a big deal, but um, I'd be, I would be more comfortable Oh, and I, I said, and obviously I would never ask you to do anything that I wouldn't do. And he said, all right, so if you take off all your clothes, I'll take off all of mine. Um, I didn't realize at the time that he was a beekeeper. So then later on when I was photographing him on the roof, I was buck naked standing in a swarm of bees. That sounds painful, um, actually. Painful. I did not get stung. It was one of those like awesome moments where you're like, I'm naked photogra photographing a guy in a swarm of bees. <laughs> on a roof in Carroll Gardens. Like, amazing. I mean, not for nothing, the high points were so insanely high that like, I'm like, I've done drugs, they were not that fun. <laughs> um, but that's what I wanted, I wanna, I wanna hear from you what these projects have taught you or what you learned about relationships. I, it took me a year to walk away from that project. I didn't make work for a year afterwards. I tried, it didn't work. What happened? I, what was going on? I was, because I had let, I, I, was, we, I have a, two friends who sometimes go as far as I do. Um, and <laughs> so um, I refer to it as like tumbling down the rabbit hole where like it envelops your whole life. Um, and, and this very good friend of mine who was an advisor in grad school and all this stepped in at month 11 and was like, Sean, I love you. I love this project. It's brilliant. I know you thought you would find someone in it. You've learned everything you can learn. You need to cut the cord. How can we end this nicely? And I looked at him and I, I said, well, the first one was on January 16th. 
it's mid-December. Why don't we do it? I cut it at 365. Um, so the last month was sort of funny because I was like, guess I might as well go all out on the sucker because I only got 30 days left. Um, and the last guy I photographed, um, I got off rentboy.com. So he was an escort because I realized that that was something I didn't learn. I didn't learn that kind of relationship, which is still a profile, right. still like it's the same exact thing, but there's a money exchange for that, for whatever I want my experience to be. Mm -hmm. And what happens when you do that? So I was like, I don't know what that feels like. Um, so it was kind of amazing. <laughs> I kind of was really, really, really impressed. I think I learned more from him than I did from most other people. Really? Because our relationship was so transparent. Yeah. Very like, clear. it was very clear, like, he made me feel the way I wanted to feel, and he was good at it. Mm -hmm. Like, he made, and I'm talking, like, from a strict emotional standpoint, mm -hmm. he made me feel both special and common at the same time. Um, I remember him saying to me, like, I really like this work, but you have to know that you're not the first person to roll through here with some art project. You know, like, so he's, but like, it was really successful the way that he sort of like balanced out me wanting him to stroke my ego. Obviously, I'm kind of paying him for it. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, kind of keeping that in check yes. by giving me a little bit sort of like this reality thing. Mm -hmm. And I was really impressed. I was like, wow, you... I mean, clearly he'd done it before. <laughs> yes. um, and, and that it was all an exchange. Mm -hmm. That like, I'm gonna do this for you, you're gonna do this for me. We had a genuinely really good time together. I 100% believe him when he said he had a load of, loads of fun with me. Mm -hmm. um, but there was this transparency, like at any point I could say like, I don't want this at any point he could say I don't want this and like we would decide how the that money fell mm -hmm. and we would walk away mm -hmm. right it wasn't this like oh I don't know I don't know I don't, like this like constant like back and forth negotiation of people that aren't being clear about what they want right, right. right? it was the first time in a year that like my relationship was clear and transparent and I could say this is what I want and he could say I can't do that and we could both walk away and that was fine. So then, you know, uh, to me, something, there's something in that about the emotional aspect and how emotions it was, complicate. But it was, we were, I was, we were still emotional together. Mm. So then talk, what, what then is that? What is we that were line? just emotionally honest. Like, it wasn't all, like, wrapped up in, like, what does this all mean? It was just like, all right, we're here, we're now, this is what we get right now. If it goes beyond that, it goes beyond that. If it doesn't, it doesn't. We're just going to actually engage in a very real way. It was sort of weirdly refresh refreshing, like, having, a you know, a couple hundred dollars in between you and that. Like, Do you think that's something that um, can be achieved without money as the... Yeah, totally. Okay. I also think it gave me this, like, weird eye-opening to, like in a lot of relationships that from the outside you're like oh that one's about money yeah now i'm like oh i get how that works now <laughs> i've never been in a relationship that was about money mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like it's it was something to learn from the professionals right so. and i i think that that was there was a lot and especially like i mean maybe it was just especially so refreshing to me because i'd gotten so I don't know. I always say when I, when I photograph someone, I fall in love with them just a little bit. Mm -hmm. And that's how I make a good photograph of them. And so then if you're a person that I've found online who I think is attractive and interesting, I already have a little bit emotionally invested in our interaction on a personal standpoint. Right. Then I have to go in there and be a professional and fall in love with you a little bit as a professional to make a good photograph of you and then those things get to be the same thing. And then it starts to make everything way more complex in your brain. 
And that's when I think I really started having trouble walking away from even bad dates. Right. I mean, especially bad dates. Good dates, bad dates, it didn't matter. I was so emotionally, I just joke, like, I, was, I, I thought, oh, I'm a strong person. I could totally handle this. And then I picked up my art practice and I picked up my life and I crumpled them into one little ball and I was like, okay, now I'm gonna just deal with this thing. And I think in the sort of like post-grad school world where you're like struggling to figure out how to like have a life, survive as an artist and still make, mm -hmm. like that was my solution. I'll just put them all and make them the same thing. Mm -hmm. Like I'm just gonna multitask. Mm -hmm. And in reality, before that, like when my work wasn't working out, like I would like sort of dump a little energy into my personal life and just sort of like blow off steam over there. And that would sort of be like the safety hatch, right? And then I would like close that up and I like, you know, focus back on my work and like my life would be get, get screwed up and I would just like dump all my energy into my work and that would be my safety hatch over there. And it was really nice having those two things that like, you know, I could work back and forth from. And then I put them all together and then it was like nuclear warfare. Well, here we are yeah. talking about social engagement. Right? And so much of the idea, at least for me, yeah. is about the kind of confusion between where life ends. ends and work begins and work ends and life begins and, you know, must I be my art? You know, this kind of age old, right, conflict, right? But, you know, this project is about kind of dealing in that problematic. Right? Oh yeah, like let's churn up the bottom. Yeah, from like the yeah. Social as your medium, you know, that's just you know that's where your inspiration comes from. So yeah. All the conflict that is a part of that, you know, all the kind of um, the explosiveness that comes out of that is precisely what it is that that we're interested in. That yeah. We're, we're, that we're dealing in. And so I want to hear your ideas about this notion of social engagement and socially engaged art. You know, for me, it's very much about practices like yours, where you need people. You must have interaction between individuals. It's, it's funny. So I've been, I have a really good friend, Kate, who's a curator, and um, we've become really, like, back and forth on this conversation, like, like why, like, and, and this, and I, we, I wasn't using the word social practice at the time when this conversation started a couple of years ago. It was like, what makes my practice different than a painter that's painting about their life? Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter if it's abstract, doesn't matter if it's figurative, what makes it different? Like, because I say my life and my practice blend together in a different way than I think yours does. Mm -hmm. Like, what happens when that painter says, what are you talking about? I'm doing the same thing. Right? Like, which they have every right to say. Right. Like, right. where is that line? And somewhere in there, somebody turned me on to this small writing. And I'm going to have to try to find it. It's like some guy that directed, like, Radiohead videos. I can't even remember who it, who it is, but he, right, he just does these small, short writings. And turned me on to this, um piece about this guy who, and it's, you know, a fictional story, about this guy who um, opens a restaurant mm -hmm. and no one wants to eat there. Um, and then somewhere in the, this, he starts crying, collecting his tears and making salts out of them and bleeding and making another spice out of them and ejaculating and making another spice out of them. And he starts using them in the food and it becomes tremendously popular. So he becomes happy, so he cannot cry anymore. So and then, then the food goes downhill. And then, so then he like can't ejaculate anymore. And how this sort of, his emotional state and what he ha has and can give mm -hmm. is both affected by the practice itself and affecting the practice itself. Yes. And that there's this like cyclical sort of snowball. And at the end, he learns to ejaculate out of sadness and to cry out of ecstasy. Mm -hmm. So that 
there's an evolution. So that there's an evolution of that, that actually the practice changes him. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where my practice is different than someone who paints the way they feel. Mm -hmm. Is that the practice changes me and I change the practice and the practice changes me and I change the practice. And that I learn from what I make and what I make learns from me. And in that cycle, where do you locate the art? I don't know, in the middle of the ball? Huh? In the middle of the ball? In, in the, the middle, middle of, of the ball? mess? In the middle of the mess. Um, I think, I think to other people, right? Like the photo, those photographs I think are both the instigator mm -hmm. and the detritus. Mm -hmm. Right, like they're both so important in the practice because the practice is about that act of photography and what it means, but the photographs are not the art any more than that date was a performance piece, right. which is why I was sort of for a short time calling it lived performance. It's like my life is performance and performance is my life, but performance implies that I think performance implies that it's not my life mm -hmm. or that or that it's less truthful right. right but I think that my background as, an, as a performer has always not made me feel not that way but I think it, that word reads to others that way and I think that my practice has always been all that I've ever been able to understood was like myself as object, myself as stage, myself as location for conversation, right? Myself as instigator, myself as performer, right? Like putting on some other person, which is never, right? A good actor never puts on some other person and like completely doesn't understand that person like you have to understand everything about them to be a good actor so your whole drive is to try to figure out right that moment where you're like this is not that person I will shelve that part of my personality put it over there because this is not who this person is this little thing about me I'm now going to make it big I'm now going to put it on the forefront and I'm now going to love it right and now I can understand and 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 help other people to understand this thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's always been my sort of understanding of art practice. So, and like, you know, I never read Susan Sontag's on photography until I was like too old for that to like change the course of my understanding of what it being an art maker was. Right, but I, even, even reading it when you did, I think you read it at the perfect time. Right, because mm -hmm. it, you are, you're so able to locate yourself and position yourself in relation to a piece of writing like that and then to see where you are, you know, comparatively to... Right, to read it afterwards and you're like, whoa! That's why every time I apply to a photo competition, they tell me I'm not a photographer. <laughs> right? I mean, you know, it makes right? it like, an incredible clarity in terms of where people are coming from. I know. Um, especially when you align yourself to something like photography or even, I mean, you think in art in general, you know, art can be, as you were saying before, very stringent and very boundary specific, which also I think is what makes this project very challenging as well for us as grant makers because we are wanting to get beyond those boundaries and create, right. for lack of a better term, parameters and criteria, but based on our experiences with artists who, you know, have allowed us to identify them as socially engaged. You know what I mean? And I think it's interesting, that, like, social engagement has come up as as a term, I think, Absolutely. really in the past couple of years, yes. as you're hearing people kind of use it a couple of years ago, but everyone's kind of like, well... That feels to most people like you're serving the community in the happiest, fluffiest sort of like what a politician would be happy with right. kind of sense. And, when, and that's sort of where it's coming from, I think, that what it sounds like to us in the beginning. Yes. And now I feel like, so 
I feel like my practice falls into that now, that we're sort of ha- actually getting to have a dialogue about that conversation. You know, I, I always say, like, when people who know art, I'm like, what do you call Sophie Call's work? Like, she's doing this a long time ago, right? Like, no one, like, but the photo world somehow picked her up as, like, being a photographer, right? So she's, like, always billed as a photographer. That's right. She ain't no fucking photographer. Like, she's like early social practice, man. She's right, like that amount of gifts on that birthday and that amount of people coming. And then I'm only gonna eat green things this one day. Yes. Like, are you sure she's really a photographer? <laughs> you know, but we don't really have some term for her. I think she's the person that I look back on and I think. If I had an art mom and dad, I wanted to be Sophie Call and Felix Gonzalez Torres. Oh, that's incredible. I mean, you couldn't pick two better. I'm just art like, I'm like, than that. we have two dime store clocks hanging in our bathroom <laughs> as, as perfect lovers. But I don't reset them every day, though, I'm supposed to. Um, I'm also very fascinated by what happens to your body and the work that you do. Um, and I want to relate it somehow to this idea of generosity. Yeah. Right? You know, what it is that you give up, what you give of yourself. And just take, take us through that, you know, how, how you kind of subvert yourself in order to participate in your own work. Subvert. I don't know I choose how the word subvert. You can be on yourself, or do you? Do you not? I, I, I think I just participate. Um, but you do. You're, but you're so you're a selective participant. Yeah, but I mean, I don't know. I don't know that. I think part of it is the hilarious part of it is actually <laughs> that one of the things I hated most about being an actor is like your body is no longer yours, right? Like, if I wanted to dye my hair and get a tattoo like that's a problem to most casting directors Mm -hmm. right like all of a sudden I'm blonde who are you (laughs) now we have to like get new headshots start pitching you in a totally different way because casting directors and all the people with the power have no imagination at all about what you could be Mm. if I walk in with brown hair wearing glasses like that's who I am the next time if I walk in blonde with no glasses who are you like it doesn't matter if I've been in three shows with them like it doesn't like you stop owning your own body like I always had issues because I always felt like you know as a guy in musical theater like if you don't have a six-pack and you're not like Mr. Perfect and six foot two and like a high baritone, like kind of end up with the bit parts, mm-hmm. right? And I'm five foot six, a high tenor, which would have been great if I would have been six foot two and a high tenor and like, you know, like perfect body and all that stuff. But I was never that person. And I always struggled with that in theater. Um, and I think to a certain extent, my freedom with and my relationship to my own body is sort of the result of that and the rebellion of that at the same time. Um, that like, now I can do whatever I want. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm gonna change if I think that this, that's the best idea mm-hmm. because I'm the creative mm-hmm. and I have a sense of imagination. And, and then I think with like, the, especially with that project, the one I'm working on now is like, that's a different story. Um, I think especially with that project, it was also like a result of my greatest fears um, that I got so close to the work and the work I mean I in somewhere in there I created something that didn't exist before and I embodied it yeah I mean you talk about this confluence this third entity that arises out of these kind of, you know I, coming together my acupuncturist put me in a trance and I talked to him once. <laughs> the tap dancer. I sw- swear to God. 
<laughs> um, but yes, there was, there was this other thing created. Right. Um, and it was funny because everybody else talked about it before I knew. Okay. Like all, everyone that was close to me was like, would talk to me about how like, one of my best friends, we would be out and he would be like, I'm going home. <laughs> You're like, why? He's like, tap dancer's here, gotta go. And he would leave um, because- You couldn't see it in yourself, but other people could see it in Yeah. You. Yeah, it would, it would happen to me. When I started realizing it was happening was when I was able to take back control. Um, but I did verge into the, I did not have control of, of, of that thing that was other than me, mm -hmm. that had been the resultant thing yeah, I mean, I of this practice. It speaks to, I think, otherness in general. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We don't have control over our otherness. Right. To, um, a, large, to a large extent. Have you, I know that this, it's one of the most watched TED Talks, the Elizabeth Gilbert. No, TED Talk. Oh my God, you have to watch it. I'll look for it. On nurturing creativity. Okay. Um, it's amazing. But there's this. Um, d she talks about in it that like anyone who's a creative, and it that it sounds a little crazy, right? Anytime you try to like describe uh, your practice, like it sounds a little kooky, <laughs> right? Like there's this thing that's other than you that somehow like part of your practice. Because true, like a really intense practice includes this sort of like other thing, you know? And she, t she actually talks about the history of what that other, how that other thing is perceived. Um, and that, and so, you, so you have to, I don't want to sort of ruin the punchline because it's a really beautiful TED talk. Um, you should send me the I'll send you the link for it. It's really one of those, I make all my students watch it every semester. Um, at the beginning of the semester to talk, just talk about like what it, like how to nurture creativity in, in yourself and how to not train wreck in that process. Right. I mean, the, the otherness is a very productive space, you know, but it's, it's exactly what you're saying. It's this kind of precarious. It's a precarious space that you, sure. I, I think that the first time I truly, truly saw that space was on this project. Mm -hmm. And it made me really respect that space. Like, like it's like, it's like the ocean. Like yes. you go swimming in it, you respect it. Cause you can drown in it. That's right. Like, That's absolutely like right. you respect the otherness. Mm -hmm. You do not mm -hmm. like, cause you can just, you can go, go into dark places there and w without, without sort of like keeping an eye for on shore, keeping your head out of water, understanding where you are. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I, I went a little bit deeper than I would advise is a totally yeah, healthy advice. practice. Yeah. Um, I mean, at the same time, right? Like that sort of like idea of the tortured artist is so prevalent in uh, certainly our culture. Let's just right. sort of identify it that way that it also gets romanticized. Mm -hmm. So like that part of my practice is also like a romantic idea of what it means to be an artist. Mm -hmm. um, and, and at the same time, like I admit, I think that was a big turning point in my practice is like that work because I now, I, th I think it's some of my better work. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, I think that like that level of commitment, which I think is what you're ident identifying as generosity in some ways. Oh. Expand on that. I'm going to hear you expand on the use of the term commitment in relation to what I'm identifying as generosity. It's when you take your art practice and you give it everything you could possibly ever imagine. I gave it my whole life mm -hmm. for a year. Like no joke for one year. That's all I did. Like I taught to pay the bills. I mean, I racked up a lot of credit card debt going out on a lot of dates. Um, you know, I mean, 
hell, it's really funny to write that off, you know, like. <laughs> um, but, and, the, and that was the consideration in my dates, like, because they all signed releases, right? Um, so that level of commitment is where you are so generous to the world that you're willing to put your whole life at stake to try to find something out and then you're going to give it away. And, and who knows what will happen once you give it away? Who knows? You, you completely make yourself vulnerable, right? It's... Yes. Wide what open. you got. Wide open, that's right. You know? Do you want to talk about the blind date? Sure. Project a little bit? Just well, like let's, I'll, let's, I'll finish out with that because this is how it ended. 365 broken plates. Oh, the, okay. So at day 365, it, David Getze is one of my favorite people on the planet. He was my advisor, he was my art history teacher, then he was my advisor, then he was a mentor, and now he's just like a best friend, and he's the one that stepped in at month 11, was like, I love you, stop. <laughs> Figure out how. And he's like, on the last day, do something for you. And um, there was a that like it, it gotten like really, really gone a little bit too far. I'd gone beyond safety into like so un insanely vulnerable that like I, yeah, I was I was I was hurting very, very, very deeply. And um, and I just wanted to scream and break plates all the time. <laughs> Um, so a friend of mine owned a gallery in Chicago and I, and I said, you have a brick wall in the back and how do you feel about me breaking 365 plates up against a brick wall? And she looked at me and was like, sure, why? <laughs> um, so on that last day, um, that gallery is, uh, one of the bigger apartment galleries out there. So it's two spaces and there's French doors in between them that are never there, mm -hmm. but they still have them. So we popped the French doors back on, put me in the back room, stacked 365 plates, um, by, by a month. So there's a short stack at the beginning and a short stack at the end. So you could actually track what day I was on if you were really paying attention and wanted to. Um, and then I had my calendar open, music blasting, and um, just my intern in there. Um, and uh, everybody else sat in like, fur like couches and sort of household furniture. So it felt like a domestic space. Mm -hmm. um, so the breaking of place was, uh, it was called OPA. So it's both like the celebration, you know, you, you break the plate and you say OPA, right. because that means that like I am full and I do not need this. And I, and I because I know there will be more food, right? And both this idea of domestic tension. Yes. Um, so I DJ'd myself across the year. So I, I, I used music to put myself back in the emotional state of each day. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that song lasted for four or five days. Sometimes it was abruptly cut off and back in, into the middle of the next song. So I DJ'd myself across the year and I broke plates to sort of release the sort of emotional state. So sometimes it was about celebration mm -hmm. and sometimes it was about devastation. Right. Um, so, I, you know, it was, it was like throwing away and celebrating at the same time. And so I went across the year that way. Um, so it, I, I can show you that the, the before and after pictures are hilarious. <laughs> uh, you put all these souls into your life, you know, it, it, it makes perfect sense. That yeah. You so I had a, had an audience. Absence sponsored the event, which was also hilarious. Absinthe? Yeah, my friend is like does absence sponsorship. So I was like, we sponsor the event. So everyone's sort of like drinking absinthe and watching me like <laughs> emotionally DJ myself across the year and break all the plates. Um, and then I I I was in Chicago at the time. So then I actually like I drove them back. And my of course my parents were like, why do you have boxes of broken plates in your trunk? Are you from Chicago? No, I'm I'm from New Jersey. Oh. So when I got home, I, you know, I hadn't found a place to live yet. Um, so I like was putting all my stuff in my dad's basement. And he was like, why am I carrying boxes of broken plates into my home? Um, so this is the, this is the, these are the OPA plates. Um, 
and then, you know, had to run away from that for a little while. Um, you know, gave myself almost a year, went to East Africa. To, two of my friends were uh, helping. One of my friends raised enough money to build a school, personally raised enough money to build a school in, um, in Arusha, Tanzania. Um, and they moved there for a year so she could work with different communities to try to find one that it was appropriate to build a school for, mm -hmm. that, that would not shirk the responsibility of now having the school right. um, and would not use it as a cash cow yeah. for, for the very few and that it would actually serve a community. Right. So she spent a year there doing that and my f other friend was um, at the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda working mm -hmm. there for the year. So I just got on a plane and went. And um, the intention was to teach, volunteer teach photo classes there. I just brought a bunch of um, secondhand cameras and school had not been registered yet. So uh, I donated all these cameras to the school so that they could have digital photo classes there. Um, they were just good. Like I, I needed that like month in a distant place in another world where everything about how people looked at me was different. Like all the markers that I, when I walk down the street here, the markers for me are, you know, like gay boy, white boy, you know, artist, whatever you are, but they're like pretty standard, you know, like it's the way that I have learned to understand myself. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I, I was platinum blonde too at the time, when I walk down the street in Nairobi, like all those things are not what they're thinking about. <laughs> like to some people, it's like pink elephant on roller skates. What, you know, who is this, person? Who is this platinum blonde, blue eyed <laughs> white guy that's just like casually walking down the street, What's he doing here? you know, cause all the tour guide books are like, do not ever walk down the street, take cabs everywhere. And I was like, yeah, fuck that, <laughs> you know, so. I was, it was so refreshing to just be like, not seen in, I mean, some of it was totally like, also just equally limiting. Mm -hmm. um, but sure. just to be totally in a different world where everything that people normally thought about me based on just looking at me was different. Right. I didn't, I, it was new baggage, you know? <laughs> like, oh, I haven't tried this baggage I, this one looks cute, okay. you know, like, <laughs> and it was really, I, it was really nice. Um, I definitely came home a senior person, getting to step outside. Mm -hmm. It was okay. really just very convenient. When they got married, they got married right before they left, and I was the ring bearer because I'm the inappropriately old ring bearer for everyone. <laughs> I've done it twice, and I think I've been asked to do it another three times in my adulthood. So you have, you know, you have a, a gig if you should ever. I have a gig. Um, <laughs> well, stop taking photographs. A girl at the New York Times told me if I made it to five, they would do it. They would do it. They, they would do a style, <laughs> style section article on me. Should. And I was like, you know what? I really was hoping to end up in the New York Times as an artist first, <laughs> but I'll take Ring Bear. Ring <laughs> um, but I just walked away from their wedding and they, and they were like, we'll see you in Africa. And I said, yes. And I try to keep to my word and I really needed to get away. Yeah. Um, so I just bought a ticket, got on a plane, had no idea what was going to happen when I landed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my first night there was at a small celebration for the school going up held by like the local Maasai tribe just for her mm -hmm. where they like sang to her. And I was like, oh my God, I'm so not in my element anymore. This is the greatest thing ever, you know? And just like, really had like an amazing time not being me. Yeah. Right. Um, because in that project, I had, I had been somewhat disruptive to a lot of, in a lot of people's lives. And to some people that was aggression. Um, so, I lost some friends mm. that were not great friends, I didn't lose any great friends, more friend acquaintances mm. that were like people I went out on dates with. And then it turns out that they were like best friends with someone that I was like medium friends with, <laughs> who I never heard from again. Because the act of photography 
to them at the end of the day felt violent. Wow. That it was like, I was taking advantage of them right. and it's that really simplistic idea of like photographer as taker voyeur. Yeah. and voyeur yeah. and that like you know that really simplistic idea that the photographer has all the power right. um so fast forward to a couple months later Naomi approached me about doing this tour and she said I want it to be based on your practice or your knowledge base. Mm -hmm. And... So she came to you with the concept of the tour? The tour. Iron, the Iron Maiden tour. Artist Tours okay. is her thing. Okay. And then, and she picked me as an artist. And I met Naomi through Hank, actually. Oh, okay. Um, I was at a show he curated. Naomi was standing next to me. And Hank's, this is like four years ago, like way before we ever even... Um, and Hank said, I think you guys would like each other. <laughs> And then we've like mildly kept up and I ran into her at an event and we started talking a little bit more and more. And she went on a residency and wrote me on the residency and was like, I want you to do a tour, I've decided. So we like sat down um, and we're talking about it. And I am also like everyone's New York tour guide. Like when people come in from out of town, they're like, what's fun tonight? Like their friends write me on Facebook to find out what's good on a Wednesday night. You know, like I tend to know where the party is or like where really weird quirky things are around the city. Um, and I've just done all this, like just dated like crazy, you know? And so, and I like strangers. Right. So you have, you have somewhere in there, you know, in the beginning we were like, I was like, oh, well, let me take two people on date. So, and then in the beginning I was like, oh, I kind of like doing like some sort of dating thing, but I don't want it to be totally limited to like what's already happened. Like I wanted, would like to do something different. And then we were like, no, no, we should, we should stay away from the dating stuff. Um, we can incorporate my practice in some other way. And then it's like, well, my knowledge base in New York city is that like, you know, I know like I'm one of the few people that like happily goes to Staten Island to go hang out. Mm -hmm. You know, people... You are one of the few. Like, I have friends in Staten Island who, like, you know, who grew up there and some of them who still live there. And, like, I totally go to events in Staten Island. Like, no biggie. Um, I'm always game to go, like, I go to the Bronx sometimes. I go to, like, Staten Island. I, you know, wherever it is, I'm fine. Um, Long Island, New Jersey, whatever. Let's just go where the really interesting things are. Like, that sounds awesome. I want to go see, like, that thing. Um, so we were talking about that part of me yeah. and I was also thinking, I think I'd just seen Taryn Simon's talk about the American index of the hidden and un unfamiliar. Mm -hmm. Do you know that work? No. You should look at it. It's okay. really, really amazing. She goes to like secret sites around the country and photographs them. So it's like the only marijuana crop plant that's fe funded by the federal government. And then she photographs like the cryogenics chamber that the guy who invented cryogenics mother wife and daughter are in and then she got, like photographs like the avian quarantine facility that's like on the island off Queens and then she photographs the transatlantic cables that go across the US between the US and um, and Europe so it's this sort of like she describes it as a strange a sort of like bewildering entropy of different kinds of sites mm -hmm. and so I think I just seen that and was thinking about me as tour guide <laughs> and me as tour guide in the US so I was kind of thinking about like like weird sort of like sites around New York City right. and like taking people to those things and then that slowly turned into can I pick people up on the street but then what if we can't find enough people that are willing to get in a car um, and then the dating thing sort of came into it and I was like well I don't want it to be one date then it sort of spiraled into that um and in the beginning we were a little idealistic actually in a funny way that we were like oh we'll get it we can get enough like queers bisexuals like everyone and somehow and then we did the map the map the okay. map on like if you start out with a straight couple and then you go to a straight person and a bi person then you can get a gay couple in there like where we were just going to like rotate through people all day. 
my god that the classification on that level became so like such a headache that we did gay in the morning and straight in the afternoon oh. <laughs> is that how it worked out yeah that's what that because because Boil it, down. it was just so much easier that way yeah. um <laughs> i was like i was like you're functionally heterosexual you're in the afternoon you're functionally gay you're in the morning um so that that work was kind of the brainchild of like all of the, I mean, all of my practices previous to it. Previous. What did you, I, I think it's, it's much more straightforward in your previous projects, what it is that you're receiving from your, from your subjects right. in that regard. So what, what did you open up, allow, allow yourself to open up to and receive it from your, your participants in this regard? Well, it was interesting, I think ultimately because I was designing a game inside of somebody else's structure. Mm. Right? Her structure is artist in the front seat, sell the two back seats, tour in her car of New York City. Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay, I have to work in that structure. Right. right. So then it was about me figuring out how to probably mostly just screw it up. Because I probably, like, her whole idea was like, I'm going to put two people in the back seat. We're going to sell each seat for $125. That is what this tour is. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what if we... <laughs> sell it to seven people each one of them's only in the car for three hours but they overlap for an hour and a half we drop people off at random subway locations across the city we pick new people up they go on a second date we take them to different locations i'll have a cooler in the back i'll be mixing cocktails giving them snacks taking them to different locations and it's really a giant date from beginning to end um because we did city island to coney island and we started out with croquet in the the pelham bay parkway mansion museum gardens mm -hmm. and ended riding the cyclone for the cyclone's 85th birthday so all these people are on one big date why date with each other to a certain yes degree. and the but the funny thing is the only consistent date is me and naomi sitting yeah. in the front seat <laughs> that's the irony the irony is that like really <laughs> it was like the most awesome day for the two of us <laughs> you know and everyone got these like really hilarious three hour chunks of time yes. you know where it was both like celebratory and camp and me needling them mm -hmm. um you know it was like tea sandwiches and croquet at like at like 10 a.m in pelham bay park in like the, this mansion museum backyard and then it was like i gave another couple like flowers and we i dropped them we, in we bought plastic i bought plastic flowers in front of them in fact at this like tiki tacky bouquet shop across the street from the first cavalry cemetery in queens because i'd never been there and i really wanted to go because this is all about me really that i want i was like things that i want to do um but uh so and then naomi and i and then we we all got glasses of rosé because that's what you do at that hour um and we gave them, I think it, oh, I have them somewhere, plastic flowers, and they had to compete with us to find the oldest tombstone in the cemetery. They were, we were given like 30 minutes, and then we had a picnic. Mm -hmm. You know, like it's sitting amongst the tombstones, like looking at a Manhattan. It was hilarious. Like it was just like everybody had these like weird days. We went to, um, we gave the gay boys the really pastoral stuff because I thought that like. <laughs> Um, then we went to um, the um, the Onderdonk House, which is the oldest colonial home oh, in nice. New York City, which is like out in the middle of industrial Bushwick. It's sound yes. surrounded by giant factories. Yes. It's behind like that studio building that Regina Rex is in. Do you know the get the Regina Rex Gallery? Is it in um, which train stop is that? Is it past this one? Yeah, yeah, it's three or four past. I can't remember exactly which one it is. I think it's DeKalb. Yeah. But it's like, ver it's almost Queens. Right, right. Um, and then um, my, the, my first straight date was I, I really thought that um, we should go to an old school peep show. I wanted to, I wanted to like pump quarters into, into something and have like a little screen come up and see someone dancing. That's really what I wanted. So we contacted lots of people. We like I hunted this down, and I ended up on this like giant mission to find this. And what was really fun was trying to find it more than anything else. Because um, when you do find it, it's like very like, oh, that's what it is. Okay, oh, all right. 
<laughs> so I ended up like giving giving this couple parameters. They just met in Times Square. Mm. I gave them drinks in subway cups so, so that no one would know that they had cocktails and, and gave them like an eight block radius, one side of the street. They had to go to all the sex shops and try to find it. And I gave them $10 in singles. Um, and they got like harassed by a stripper in a little booth, you know, and they came out and like, they had the best time ever. And then we had hot dogs, <laughs> you, know? you know, like, so we did like really weird, quirky things across the city that sort of like didn't really make sense, but they were all like, as a New Yorker, like, we deserve to have done that. That's right. Yeah. Like, I don't live here to have not done that. That's right. You know, and I was really interested in, A, putting people outside their comfort zone. Right. Right, like, I put two gay boys in that situation. It's like, I've been to the gay bar so <laughs> many times where they're like, there's some guy naked on the on the bar dancing, trying to like put their balls in my drink, whatever. It's been there, done that. It's not, but like, you know, I picked like an adorable, fun, like, you know, I sort of, we sort of mildly knew both of them. And I was like, they can both totally, we'll, we'll have, this will put them outside their comfort zone, but they'll be like really sort of like fun about it. Um, which I, totally correct. Actually, one of them is going to be my new roommate next month. Um, I, but so we, I like really tried to push people outside comfort zones and give them like sort of like experiences to like sort of have, really have fun with. Um, and like cocktails and appropriate food and like, you know, like tried to do like a whole like hour and a half like encapsulated experience for your joy, you know? What really struck me about it, you know, I was so sorry that I could not make that. I'm so bummed you didn't. So if it ever happens again, you know. There, both Naomi and I are like, I would love to do this on a regular basis, but man, it's like, it's intense. It was, it was really, it was a really intense thing to do. The intensity of it comes through, I think, in just reading the project and what was very, what I was intrigued by was how the anonymity of it made the details so immense. You know, like, you don't, you, you be on the blind date, don't know where you're gonna go. You know, you really you know, kind of strip the participant down to completely nothing but jumping into this idea of going on a, a guided bond date tour, which is enough in itself. Right. Like, I, you know, I, I, I must. Like, what could this possibly be? But the greatest thing about that is, I didn't. In the beginning, I was like, well, we should probably figure out who would be who would be great together. And then we're like, no. They said yes to this. Yeah. I mean, like <laughs> they're game. Like just go with it. That's right. Like. We'll try to kind of figure it out a little bit, but like, I'm not going to be worried about. Then we were like, first group of people that say yes, we're just going to do that. Yeah, like, the itinerary, but the players all kind of remain, you know. The players the show level. themselves. Right. Like, that by volunteering to be part, like, to enter yourself into that space, you are already the type of person that needs to meet each other. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, you need to meet each other. Whether you find great love or just someone to laugh your ass off with right. for an hour and a half, or someone that just like sets something off in you, right. like wakes you up in a different way, like your sense of adventure is what we ended up celebrating. And the sharing in that with someone who you don't know. In a car with no air conditioning. <laughs> A 1988 Volvo station wagon with 350,000 miles on it that's falling apart. And like, we're like, there's, there's a cooler with water back there. Here's your cocktail. Let's go. That's how you make memories. Yeah. You know what I mean? Right. That's precisely how memories are made. And it was, I mean, I think I was, Naomi can tell you, I was a wreck leading up to that project. Cause I was like, I don't know. I want to make sure everyone has a good time. Like hopefully like nobody hates me afterwards. Like, I don't know. like, you know, like I was so like, oh, with this date, I don't know if that date's fun enough, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> like there was just like my, my dad, it's so funny where I come from a long line of uh, hosts. Like I really, I, I'm a great party host. I will, I will make sure everyone in the room is having a great time. 
And then I was like so worried that like one person wouldn't have a great time. And that, that would like sort of like, it would just like ruin the whole thing. And so I overcompensated and like, now thinking back on it, I probably should have just like, not quite got, like, I mean, I, I was like at Target in the middle of the night trying to like find a croquet set. Yeah, I was like, I was like, everything has to be perfect. You know, like, type of detail. no, but I think that's actually kind of why it was so much fun. Like, once, once, like, the first two people got in the car, I was like, there's nothing I can do now. You know, and I was like, I was, and, and I think that's the point where you just, like, what I ended up giving up was control at that point. Yes. We're in the car for the next 10 hours. I have no time that I can do anything to change the course of this day. I have no control. Now, I'm in it just like everybody else is. Like... And we were, it was like a group date. We were all on a date together. Mm-hmm. You know, like, they were really supposed to be on a date, but it was like, hey, if you guys don't like each other, I mean, we can make out, I don't know. You know, like. There's reinforcements, just in case. Just in case. And it was also, like, funny when, like, one couple sort of, like, slipped away for a little while. And we were like, yes, totally, that's awesome. Another couple was like, one of them got off the date, and then later on, like one of them confessed to me that when that person left, they were like sexting. <laughs> you know, like, I, they were like sexting with their first date on their second date. You know, like, I was like, yes, that's awesome. You know, that sort of like, it, everyone became an equal player mm-hmm. in the game. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, Naomi set up the rule, like the boundaries of what this project had to be. I put lots of games and rules into that system and then we all had to just go with it. Yeah, and participate. Yeah, and participate. And it was, the, I think what was so interesting to me is that everyone was so respectful of what those rules were. Mm-hmm. Like everyone was, I think everyone knew they were in it to play the game. Right. Like, as like a great sport sort of way. Like not, not like win anything, but to just like, for the love of the game, right? Because it was, like in the beginning, I was like so like, okay, we gotta be on time. But it was funny how you could kind of see like everybody else kind of paid attention to the times too. Like I remember like one day, like people were like, okay, well, I guess we should pack up now. And I was like, totally, that we actually do need to do that right now. (laughs) You know, and it was sort of the way in which we like, everyone sort of became a participant and a referee and like we all sort of just did this thing and it became this like sort of beautiful dance Mm -hmm. that like across I mean it was a long day it was like it ended up being 12 hours from beginning to end it was a long that was a long date girl it was a long date with a lot of people (laughs) you know Mm-hmm. But before we finish, if you could just say your name and where we are right now. Sean Vader, Bushwick. Perfect. 